That's okay. Good evening, and uh, I welcome all of you to our regular town council meeting of November 6th, and I'd ask you all to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate Caitlin Jordan on her re-election to town council, and we're happy for her to serve another three years. We'd also like to uh, congratulate Molly. If you would uh, stand, some people probably have seen you before, but Molly has uh, been elected to the town council for the first time, and we're so excited for her to join with us in the next three years. Um, so the first item that I have is we have a gentleman here who is smarting incredibly because this is his last town council meeting, and that's Frank Govanelli. You notice the big sign that we just uh, took down from here? He's going to put that on his barn uh, at the house. <laughs> that's a little parting gift. But, uh, Frank, we, um, we really appreciate the work that you've done in the last four years. You were elected in uh, 2010. Uh, for a one-year term and then uh, decided to run again for three more years. And during that time, you've served on the Ordinance Committee, you've served on Appointments Committee, you've served as the Finance Chair, you've uh, been uh, with uh, the Cemetery Trustees as the liaison, you've done unbelievable things that way. Served on a couple of committees, FOSS in particular, which was the Future Open Space Committee, and uh, did an outstanding job supporting that effort with lots of recommendations to the town in terms of how to work with an open state space plan going forward. And uh, the work that you've done this year is particularly interesting because you certainly have left what I consider a legacy and a planning document uh, with our capital improvement plan going forward, something that uh, I know uh, that I know that uh, from my perspective anyway was something that was really badly needed. And I think that you have uh, demonstrated an incredible um, vision and the ability to work collaboratively with the school board and with, with all of us over these years. And uh, I, I can tell you that uh, I tried to convince you to run again. Sorry, Molly, it would have been an, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have been an opening. But I, I think that, Frank, for, for the last four years, uh, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth um, are better for your work. And um, I, I, for one, am proud to have called you a colleague on this committee. And I think that, uh, you know, all I can tell you is uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was appointed finance chair in the other room, so I'm going to be looking for sage advice next year, mm -hmm. uh, especially as we, um, we, we deal with some major financial decisions for the community going forward. So we have a, a small token of our esteem, uh, and that is uh, something that you can put on the wall in your office and constantly be reminded <laughs> that you did attend quite a few meetings, very long hours, yes. and spent uh, some quality time making Cape Elizabeth a better place to work. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, before we let you say something, are there any of his colleagues who would like to add? Anybody? Yeah, Jessica? Well, I, I would like to say that um, we are all about to be treated to what I believe is an absolutely outstanding presentation. And, uh, and it, is, it is so hugely because of the efforts of Frank Governelli. And not having worked with him directly, well, we did on FOSS. But the Library Planning Committee was a very small committee, it was very intense, and as you will see, 29 meetings in 31 weeks, meetings averaging three hours. So I think we all feel that we have extended family now. <laughs> and it was an absolute pleasure. And anyway. so I, I will always uh, look back with honestly very fond memories of, of this experience. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, Kathy? I'd just like to echo what uh, Jessica said. and. 
just um, the amount of work that Frank put into this committee. I mean, I think we all tried to work hard, but Frank was exceptional and over the top. And I have fond memories of hearing my computer ding in the middle of the night, and it's Frank at home, quarter of two. Hi, you want to take a look at this before six? <laughs> you know, okay, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he was uh, doing his midnight thing, I guess. And um, so it's been a real pleasure, Frank. Thank you. Anyone else? Dave? Yeah, I. I don't want to, you know, heap on more praise, Frank, but uh, I, I think, no, <laughs> I think all of us wish that you would have re-upped for uh, another term or two or three on the council. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed working with you for the past four years, and uh, what I also find very uh, interesting and really, frankly, very admirable is that you've never really wanted to be the chair of the council. You've never really cared about getting the quote-unquote glory. I thought the chair, whether you get that glory is up to debate. Uh, <laughs> glory. <laughs> but, uh, We're out of order. <laughs> out of order. But, uh, you know, you came here to do work and to do good for the town, and that's just been evident from the first day you joined the council, so I will uh, indeed miss you as well and uh, wish you the best. I'm sure you'll continue to co contribute to our community, and hopefully we can uh, call you up for some... Uh, guidance uh, on some of these financial issues that we're going to be grappling with in the years to come. So thank you again. Hey, anybody else? Jamie? Yeah, well, I'll miss Frank uh, dearly. I, I think that um, without trashing any of the rest of us, I think he was the coolest head on the council. <laughs> and um, appreciated his wisdom, his intelligence, and uh, I'll, I'll miss whispering to him during the council meetings. So, uh, but I'm sure I'll see you uh, regularly for meeting with the <laughs> Well, I might as well put mine in there, too. I'm going to miss you a lot, trying to see who can get to the stop <coughs> sign first on our way up here as we <laughs> climb in at the last minute. But it's definitely been a pleasure serving with you. And I, nothing against Molly, but I, too, had wished you had re-upped with me for another three years. Well, thank you. Good. So would you like to make some uh, yes. I'll, I'll make <laughs> just a couple of remarks. I guess, you know, thank you all for those um, comments. I appreciate that. And. Uh, I think the, um, certainly my decision not to run again had nothing to do with our council, and uh, part, partly due to the fact that I think it's a great opportunity for lots of people in the town to participate in the process. I think having diverse council, people coming in with different points of view and, and ideas about what can go, what, what can occur for the town is a really good thing for the town, and I encourage everyone to think about um, providing some of their service and talent to the town in some ways, if not this, then others. Um, also, to say thanks to the fantastic staff we have in, in, in Cape Elizabeth, uh, from Mike on down, and as well as the schools, uh, from the head of the schools on down, because we're really fortunate in having terrific professionals working for us, um, and, uh, and they've been great in the various projects uh, we've worked on, whether it's the library or the finance stuff that I did with uh, Michael Moore. Uh, people were extremely helpful in terms of uh, getting things done and being very cheerful and happy to help out in all ways. I think we're lucky about that. And, um, and I think the library committee has been a, sort of an exemplar, um, uh, an, an exemplar opportunity in terms of seeing how a really good committee can work with uh, excellent leadership in Molly and um, sort of had all the characteristics, I think. We'll see if the voters like the idea when the time comes, but I think had all the characteristics of a really great committee where we had diverse opinions people's points of view were heard and, and were considered very legitimate, no matter where they were from. And we uh, all participated equally. And so I think the product reflects that. Um, and I think that it's, um, you know, I think it's character uh, of this overall, the overall town council as well. So thank you very much and good luck going forward. And I'm sure Molly uh, will enjoy it and will also contribute strongly to the future of uh, Cape and the town council. So, Great, thank, thank you, you Frank. You're welcome. Appreciate it very much. Okay, moving on to any town council reports or correspondence. Yes, Jessica. Um, <clears throat> the appointments committee had its first meeting the other night. We have two more uh, meetings later in November. Um, there are quite a few openings uh, on boards and commissions in Cape Elizabeth, and we need people to apply. We have openings on the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, the Thomas Memorial Library Board of Trustees, the Recycling Committee, the Riverside Memorial Cemetery Trustees, <clears throat> and the Board of Assessment Review. Also, um, 
In 2015, Cape Elizabeth will be celebrating its 250th anniversary since incorporating in 1765, separating from Portland, which was actually called Falmouth then. So we also need citizens to uh, sign up for that as well. The deadline to apply is November 15. Again, it has been extended. So we're hoping that people will go online in the website or come to town hall and um, sign up to, to volunteer on one of our boards. Great, thank you, Jessica. Any other reports? Seeing none, moving on to finance committee report. Any report to be made? Nothing. This is your last opportunity to <laughs> say what you want to say, sir. Well, I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then we move to the next item then, and that's uh, the first opportunity for uh, citizens to address items that are not on today's agenda. If anybody wishes to address, what's that? Nothing. They're trying to give me a signal to check a message. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> everything, all, everything all set over here? Just, just this is technology at its best. I love it. That's great. I have it. That's okay. Well, let's just, I'm glad that you folks have focused on what's important here. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't see any citizens who wish to address us, so we'll move on to the town manager's report, but he is reading a text or email <laughs> at the moment. Actually, I, I'm, I'm reading an email they tried to send me to the wrong address. Okay. Anyway, I, I just uh, want to join in thanking Frank for his, his uh, service. You know, not to the council as much, but to the community. Uh, you know, I think, I think it's been said, all of what Frank has done has really been focused on the community and what he feels is best for the community. He's definitely <coughs> supported the schools. And, you know, Frank does, you know, he does an awful lot for other places in the community too. Uh, you know, other, other than just the council, the work that he's done over the years, particularly with the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, uh, with St. Albans Church. And, you know, there, there's people like Frank who make this community a great place to live. And, uh, Fortunately, sometimes they're also willing to serve on the town council and to go to a whole bunch of meetings. And uh, it's just been tremendous to work with you to to gain knowledge and uh, to, to gain insight from your your experiences and how how fortunate that you we have been that you've shared so many of those with us. And thank you. So thank you. Great. I, I do also. Uh, I didn't do a written report this month, but I do also want to thank Deborah Lane. Uh, we, we, as has been mentioned, we had an election yesterday, and uh, it, from every account, everything went extremely smoothly. Uh, those who voted probably noticed we had new voting machines, a little bit slower than uh, the old machines, but they worked. As far as we, we know, they worked well. Uh, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to find staff for elections these days, uh, and you know, Deb really does a good chance of cobbling it together and uh, you know really want to thank her for all of her efforts this past month I was away a little bit for keeping things together and and particularly for her uh, her leadership of the election yesterday so thank you great thank you that's it Dave. okay all right moving on to the next item which is to review the draft minutes of October 7th do I have a motion Move to accept. You did that so eloquently, Greg. That's great. And do I have a second? Second from second. David. Uh, all those in favor of accepting the minutes of October 7th, it's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, we move on to the first item on tonight's agenda, and that's item 130. And that is a report from the Library Study Committee. And what we've set up here is three seats for you to join us up front if Molly and um, Kate, if you want to join us too, please. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. You need to be somewhere there's a microphone. It's a, we have the handheld mic. Mm -hmm. How about if I start? How about if I start up here and go right ahead. If we yeah, decide. No, handheld, they'll be if, hopeful to use, but that's okay. 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 
Perfect. So, is it either or? Do I have to use this one? Can I stand up there? No? Uh, how about if I start with this one, and it might be easier for these guys to use that if they decide that they want to be a little bit closer to the presentation. Okay. Is that this mic or are you making that noise? Okay. Great. Thank you. And I also will just add my couple of words to thank Frank for his participation in the Library Planning Committee. We had a terrific group of people working together on the project. I have to concur with the other two counselors who participated in the committee. Frank went above and beyond, and thank you. It was terrific. And thank you for helping tonight with the presentation, too. So um, my name, again, I'm going to go back to Molly McCausland. You don't have to call me Martha anymore. That was only for legal purposes for the election. Um, I am also just going to point out before I get started that just in order to make it a little bit easier for me, am I still on? Yes. Okay. To make it a little bit easier for me, every time I come across uh, either the library or Thomas Memorial Library, I'll just refer to it as TML, and likewise on the Library Planning Committee, the LPC. It's a little bit less of a mouthful. <clears throat> so let's jump right in. And Earlier this year, the Town Council charged the Library Planning Committee, the LPC, with uh, several tasks. The first one, and I think most importantly, was that our committee was to prepare a plan for public library services as well as facilities to serve Cape Elizabeth for the next 25 years. Next, we were charged specifically with seeking public input in our deliberations and considering lower cost alternatives than the proposal that was in front of the voters uh, just about a year ago, November of 2012. Our committee was charged with reviewing past materials and the information relating to library facilities, but we were also charged with taking a fresh look at the possibility for some other future actions. And finally, our committee was charged with looking at utilization of space for library services elsewhere in town, and we were charged with meeting with the Town Center Planning Committee to consider opportunities for enhancing the Town Center. Just to give you a little bit of background, I think the citizens and the uh, probably town council as well have exercised uh, responsible stewardship in Cape for the last, what is that, 50 or 60 years. Um, and we've seen pretty much a renovation every 20 years from 1944 through 1986. In 2005, though, the tradition was interrupted by a stalled review of the library needs that ended in the rejection of the approximately eight and a half million dollar project that was proposed to be funded or partially funded by a six million dollar bond. Since then, the library's needs have only expanded and the LPC was formed again for us to take a fresh look at the options in town. Our library planning committee first met in April of this year and as Jessica says, we've been a very busy committee. Um, we've been also very dedicated. We've had 29 committee and subcommittee meetings over a 31 week period. And as she said, I I'm not sure this represents good leadership on my part, but we really did average close to three hours per meeting. We did have substantial input from hundreds of people in the community and either individually or as a committee, we had both physical and virtual visits to 22 libraries. We looked into past, present, and future trends of both TML but also local and national libraries. We researched alternative spaces both in CAPE and, and looked at the possibility of some joint programs with other departments in CAPE, but we also talked to some neighboring communities and assessed the possibility of some joint programming with them as well. We researched comparable library upgrades that had been done in Maine, 
and eventually we interviewed four firms for architectural programming and we selected Portland based reading company and they have provided the key input for the recommendations that we'll be giving tonight. They'll be presenting in just another few minutes as well and we'll get a, a nice overview from them of um, what they have to say about the building, about the services, about the square footage, etc. and importantly about the budget. Uh, in our deliberations, we had several major questions we wanted to be sure to address. And the first one was that we all know the digital revolution is here. Why do we need to invest in bricks and mortar? Secondly, we know there's other space available in town, so couldn't we find some other space in town that would accommodate the TML? And last but not least, why would we need to address a major overhaul rather than just addressing the deficiencies themselves on a piecemeal basis. So we'll take a look at those one at a time. Again, we know that the digital revolution is here. And based on our research, we do believe that libraries will continue to be sources of information. Patrons might pick up the physical medium. They might pick up a book or a, uh, some sort of uh, media device. They might download the information at home, they might listen on the go, but <clears throat> excuse me, library offerings have to evolve with the technology and the demand. We also know any renovation that happens will need to be flexible in its ability to evolve with future library functions. Library operating budgets will have to evolve to accommodate the changing medium as well. Whether information is drawn from paper or electronic media, there's little impact on the kinds of services, though, that TML offers to CAPE. Programming services are at the core of the mission. In fiscal 2013, I think this is very interesting, over 8,000 attendees participated in 387 different programs offered in TML. So whether it's digital file or a paper book, the programs remain in demand. We have a couple of slides coming up here that Frank has been um, good enough and um, technologically adept enough to put together for us. So I'm going to let him jump in and talk about the next two. Okay. Um, what, this, what this slide uh, reflects basically is the breadth of programming uh, and the volume of participation. And uh, it really is, is presented to make the point that, uh, that library services uh, demand will remain regardless of the digital revolution. That in reality, the, that library services and programs are medium agnostic. Uh, and the reason we can say that is because when you look at the variety of programs that are offered uh, today, and they have been offered, whether they are offered with books or with an iPad, or the downloaded um, audio tape or videotape, people would be coming to those uh, programs nevertheless. So if, when you look at this chart, uh, what it demonstrates really is the sheer number of programs, and it's stunning. The uh, columns on the right reflect the different numbers of programs for different sizes of groups. And, um, and that's an important factor, because what it suggests to you is that there's programs for big groups, programs for small groups, and what this doesn't show is that there's programs for all ages as well. It tends to be very barbell, but lots of young and older folks. Um, the uh, second point is that the, um, or rather the third point is that the library is well used throughout the year. Uh, the different colors of the bars on the bar chart reflect the different seasons, uh, spring, winter, fall, and summer. And while the spring and the winter tend to be the most active, we have stuff going on at uh, TML throughout the year. Um, and so the facility, whether it's this one or some future facility, will be well occupied throughout the year, and I think it's a good resource that people, people will, um, will utilize. Finally, um, if, you were to, if you were to get behind these numbers and look at the, at the specific programs that offer it, which we do in our report, and I hope everyone takes a look at those, you'd see that whether the material and the programs were distributed online, or an iPad, or a book, it would have no impact on the participation. And so, uh, bottom line is, we, the digital revolution is upon us. None of us can predict where that will take us or how quickly it will take us there. But I can say with, uh, I think, a great deal of confidence that it's not going to impact the kind of programs, variety of programs, and the attendance at the programs at TML. 
Great. Okay. Thank you. And I think you have another slide you're going to yep. speak to here. So uh, this busy slide, and uh, thankfully you don't have to look at every dot, uh, but the red dots on these scatter plots represent uh, TML. And what they are attempting to demonstrate is where TML falls against comps in the state. And we looked at a database which had all libraries in um, Maine. Uh, I selected out the top 100, which were communities of more than 4,000 people. And I took out Portland as well, since it, it's really not a comp. It's uh, really off the charts. And um, we looked at the metrics that are good indicators of sort of activities that are going on in the library in terms of the number of patrons, in terms of the number of programs, the attendance at programs, as well as the uh, circulation. And uh, very interesting results from this. Uh, what it says is that overall, by key metrics of activity, demand for TML's functions and services are significantly above the average, and particularly above the average for, a so for the size of uh, Cape Elizabeth. Um, TML has more patrons, more programs, more attendance, and a greater circulation than 83% um, on average of all the libraries in, in, the, in the pool here, despite the fact that we're only larger than, than two-thirds of these towns. So we're really boxing out of our weight class, um, and I think that that's reflective of uh, intensive community use, and I think it implies that the community values the library services and with the right, right approach, with the right program, we think we'll value a renovation uh, that serves our needs. Uh, it's worth noting that this data is from 2011. That's the latest data that was available. And if you look at um, TML's uh, program schedule in 2013, fiscal year 2013, the programs were up 45% from this, and attendance was up 18%. So you not only have a high level of activity, but it's a growing level of activity. That's great, thank you. So moving on to our second question, isn't there enough space in other town buildings for TML? Let's take a look at that. We did a careful survey of all the town-owned buildings and we determined there is available space in some buildings in town and we'll talk about more, more about that in just a minute. Uh, we also know, however, that to use this space to meet library demands would require the relocation of the other functions that exist in those buildings already, and major renovations would be required. We also know none is as well suited as the present site of TML to address the library's needs. We believe strongly renovation and new construction of TML is the least costly and the best solution for library services in Cape. So let's take a quick look at uh, one comparison, if we look at the existing TML facility, we see there are 15,000 square feet, parking for 38 cars with overflow parking available as well. If we compare that to the police station, which we've heard fairly often from a number of sources might be a good alternative to the TML, we see that building has a little bit under 9,500 square feet and only 23 parking spaces available. So if we looked at the programming study in more detail, and we will in just a minute, that Reed will present, we see that we'd need to do a major addition to the police station building. We would need to find additional parking to go with that building. The, uh, again, the existing functions in that building would have to be located elsewhere. And then I think one of the things we also thought was worth noting and was very important, that the traffic on that roadway would include cars, but also ambulances and fire trucks, and we thought that would be very problematic for library patrons. So moving on to question three, why not just address the deficiencies instead of doing a major overhaul? We know that the deficiencies have been well documented. We have years worth of data on this. We know that there are issues with accessibility, with safety, with building flexibility for any future needs for the library. So we thought about how those should best be addressed over the next 25 years. And we believe that any future-oriented plan will require flexibility, first of all, that's not available in the current building and in its current configuration. We also think that addressing the existing deficiencies in that building can trigger requirements for remediating accessibility and life safety issues throughout the whole facility. <clears throat> 
And despite ongoing maintenance, after 27 years without renovations, we have concluded that it is definitely more economical and serves the community's future needs better to do a renovation with new construction than to address the deficiencies on a piecemeal basis. So, really importantly, can we afford a major renovation? Our architects have developed a plan for us that they have budgeted at approximately $3.9 million. If we assume a $4 million bond to cover the project cost, we think the tax impact on a median household of a 20-year $4 million bond at current interest rates is about $1 per week. And the tax impact distribution, as you can see from the slide, looks like this. Half of all households in Cape would see an impact of less than a dollar per week. A third of all households would see an impact of between one and two dollars a week. And 13% of households would see an impact of greater than two dollars per week. I have to say, I thought that was pretty compelling. So as part of our work, our committee hired Maine-based Reed & Company to prepare an architectural program for us. They helped us to define the community's needs for space, and let's talk for a minute about what we asked them to do. First, we asked them to take a quick look at the existing information, and as I said, there is seven years' worth of information out there. So they did a pretty thorough review of all the existing documentation, and they took a walk through the building to take a to get an idea of what kind of state the building was in. They also solicited input regarding the needs and goals. Um, they did develop the building program, developed some concept plans, which we'll take a look at in just a minute, and they prepared a project budget. So in just a minute, we'll talk about um, their plans in more detail. But First, I'm going to talk about our underlying assumptions with our recommendations, and then I'll move into our committee's recommendations. The first thing I'd like to point out is that we are not anticipating any major demographic shifts in the community in our planning process. We do, however, believe that um, changes in technology will continue, and those obviously will be both evolutionary and revolutionary changes, just as we've seen for the last 20 or 25 years. Um, we do, however, believe that certain library functions and services will endure for the next 25 years. And we believe strongly that the form of the library should follow the functions included in the building. Finally, we think a renovated facility should relate well to the Cape Elizabeth cultural, environmental, and historical context. We want something that fits in the community that folks feel good about. So, I'm waiting for the drum roll here after 31 weeks and 29 meetings, thank you. Here are our recommendations, and they are, as you all know, available online, and I think you've all seen them in your um, packets yourselves. We are recommending tonight that the council accept this proposal for renovations and new construction of TML, according to the programming study developed by Reed & Company. We're recommending that the council form a building committee as quickly as possible to move forward with the LPC recommendations. We recommend that the plan should not exceed $4 million, that the TML should remain at approximately the same size, 15 to 16,000 square feet, and it should remain in its existing location. We recommend that the council further explore the needs of and the financial support for the Historical Society separately from this library project. We recommend that construction be funded by taxpayers and furnishings covered by private fundraising. And we recommend that a building committee complete their work in time for the citizens to vote on that plan by one year from now, November of 2014. At this point, I'm going to introduce our architects, Dick Reed and Cynthia Lobenstein. I think they'll come up now and give us an overview of their work. And then um, after they've done their presentation, I'll come back. We'll take one more quick look at those recommendations, and I'll be happy to answer any questions and field any comments. Thanks. Thank you, Molly. 
And Cynthia and I would like to thank uh, all of the Library Planning Committee members for the opportunity to work with them on these plans for the Thomas Memorial Library. I'll briefly tell you a little bit about Reed and Company architecture and who we are. We're based in Portland. We began in 1985. One of our very first projects was a new library for the town of Denmark, Maine. And since then, we've worked on over 20 libraries throughout the state. Oftentimes, that has included additions to existing buildings, and several of those have been additions to historic buildings that are on the National Register of Historic Places. We are currently working on a, a, uh, with the Gray Public Library on their expansion and renovation. They evolved from a library in an old school that was renovated and added on to in the mid 80s, much like the TML. And currently we're doing a two-story addition that's under construction and due to be completed this January. When Cynthia and I visited the TML, we were excited by the beautiful site with the Pond Cove School Annex building forming a beautiful frame to a large green space. It was a very uh, impressive introduction to the TML. Also, the Spurwing School complements the Pond Cove School Annex building in its, in its more humble, humble appearance and, and humble location. We were also impressed by the proximity of the library to the existing elementary school and play spaces. However, we were a little um, concerned that the library seemed to turn its back on the, the, the school and those play spaces and in fact formed a barrier to, to the connection with the, the school. On the day we were there, we observed a story hour and all the activity that that generated simultaneously with the, uh, the interlibrary loan truck unloading totes to the front door, which also occurred as patrons were lining up to waiting for the library to open. So it was very clear to us that, that this was a very active community resource. We communicated our excitement to the, the library planning committee and, and were fortunate to be selected to work with them on the, the planning for the Thomas Memorial Library. As Molly pointed out briefly, that planning includes reviewing existing information previous studies, of which there was several, uh, information about the site, um, existing, looking at the existing buildings, condition and efficiencies. We attended and, and had information from the August 29th community roundtable session, and we had many opportunities to make observations on site. We solicited input from, uh, local input from, uh, we solicited a local input regarding the needs and goals of the library, obviously from the library planning committee, but also from the library director and staff, the historical preservation society, schools and community services, and the business community. We went on to develop a building program using available guidelines of, of library space allocation. Cynthia is gonna elaborate on that in the next slide. We researched and visited other libraries and we did a comparison of the existing TML to the new space allocations. We developed a concept plan based on that information, which included a site plan, a lower level plan, and an upper level plan. Those plans are, will be shown in PowerPoint, but they're also up on the wall over there, which might be an easier way to look slowly at them and, and more close up. From all that information, we prepared a project budget. Reading Company researched other library guidelines and found that for a community with a similar population of Cape Elizabeth, which is approximately 9,000 people, based on the 2010 census, that the total building size should be somewhere between 12,000 and 16,000 square feet, using the Connecticut State Library Guidelines and the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction Guideline. You can see a further breakdown of the space allocation, such as the size of the collection, staff space, meeting space, etc. Special use space includes staff break rooms, small study rooms, newspaper racks, and that sort of thing. Non-assignable space is a space necessary to support the operations of the building, but not directly for library services, such as mechanical room corridors and vestibules. When we compared the existing 
library areas to the program that we were proposing, some interesting but probably somewhat obvious figures evolved. The existing library has approximately 9,950 square feet of net usable area and 4,515 square feet of non-assignable space, which is spaces such as corridors, toilets, and stairs, for a total area of 14,465 gross square feet. The program that we're proposing has 13,670 net square feet of usable area, 2,360 of non-assignable space for a total of 16,030 gross square feet. So efficiency is measured by the net usable area divided by the total area, and we find that the existing library is about 69% efficient and we are proposing a plan that's 85% efficient. And a more relevant way to, to think of that is the existing library is 31% inefficient, and um, this translates to inefficiencies for the staff and patrons having to transport materials over excessive distances, inefficiencies with the staff being remote from the circulation desk and from each other, it includes four wheelchair lifts that inadequately connect the five different levels of the existing library. And the wasted space, the inefficient space, uh, represents uh, energy consumption, both for heating and cooling the, the, the building. This is the summary of the uh, use, stakeholders, and community input. We attended the roundtable public input session on August 29th at the Cape um, High School cafeteria, and we also led focus group meetings with the school, business community, library staff, and historical society. The paramount issue for all the stakeholders and users was, of the library was accessibility. Whether it was a mom with a stroller, or a senior using a walker, or a staff person carrying books, all of them had challenges with the many different levels and the problematic wheelchair lifts. I know this slide is difficult to read and was included more as a record of our meeting, so I'll highlight some of the suggestions from the user groups. From the school board leadership and community services, it was noted that the community center desires a walking connection with the library and its pre-K programs and aftercare programs and summer programs. It's all, it was also noted that many of the Pond Cove students go to the library after school and they get picked up later by their parents. In addition, there was an interest in having a lockable playground for the library patrons for the pre-K age group. From the business community, that we, we heard that there were no large businesses in Cape Elizabeth, but there are no, numerous small businesses, and there was interest in having small meeting spaces for perhaps less than six people that had the opportunity to have nighttime use. From the staff of Thomas Memorial Library, we learned that there was poor visual and physical connection between the circulation desk and other staff. The staff is spread out through the library and that created security and communication issues. The children's programs are also constrained by low headroom and structural columns. The day that we were visiting the story time, there was uh, 40 to 50 parents and children in the room. And lastly, the Historical Society of Cape Elizabeth uh, really needs more visibility. It doesn't have any current display space and needs archival storage space that's humidity controlled. This is an aerial photograph of the existing conditions. I'm going to um, first orient you with Route 77 and Scott Dyer Road and the elementary school and the existing TML building with the 1985 section that was built to connect the Pond Cove Annex and the Spurring School building. It's our belief that the 1985 section is a wall or a barrier between the school and the community and that we would suggest removing it. The Pond Cove Annex building, built in 1912, however, has some significance in the community and, and so does the Spurring School, so we looked at what it would mean to keep and upgrade them. We also noted that the land drops off approximately four feet towards the south side of the site, 
towards the school and that the front lawn area adjacent to the Pond Cove Annex building creates a stately presence along the Scott Dyer Road. Lastly, the grassed area adjacent to the parking lot was identified as the best place to expand the parking because we could reuse the existing vehicular entrance and keep the cars away from the elementary school children and the playground. This says proposed site plan, but it's really a conceptual diagram, not a final plan. Let me orient you again with Route 77, Scott Dyer Road, the elementary school, and the existing playground. As I mentioned, we would remove the 1985 section of the library, which is a wall and a barrier between the school and the community. We would create a pedestrian walkway through a landscaped garden and a reading garden to the school and playground. Using the natural slope of the land, we would be able to access a new addition on the south side to create an at-grade daylight lower level for a new children's room complete with an enclosed outdoor play area. By restoring and repurposing the Pond Cove Annex building, we build a two-story library addition which reduces the footprint on the ground and allows for more outdoor green spaces such as this area in the front on Pond Cove Annex, which becomes a town green. It could be used for outdoor performances. I think it, I'm showing there some movable seats. Then lastly, in this area, we have the drop-off for the buses or the cars at the front entrance with approximately 50 parking spaces and overflow parking on the grass. This is a proposed upper level floor plan and it's, as Cynthia points out, it's diagrammatic and conceptual in nature. Uh, we expect continued input and refinement as this process continues. We really wanted to be able to show sufficient space so that all functions could be accommodated. From the drop off area in the parking area, there's an entry court and an entrance lobby that includes a community bulletin area. And again, it might be easier eventually if you have a time to look at the plans against the wall, but I'll just kind of run through the general description now. So there's an entrance lobby at grade with a stair half a level up to the upper level and half a level down to the lower level. There's a three stop elevator that connects the entrance with the upper and lower level for complete handicap accessibility. At the upper level, there's a central circulation desk with support space adjacent to it for processing interlibrary loan materials and technical services and offices for the director. To the right of the circulation desk is space indicating space for computers, reference, young adult, with some smaller meeting rooms for tutorial and quiet study. To the left of the circulation desk is the adult area, including stacks and various types of seating at tables and comfortable chairs and study carrels, all looking out to the south towards the playground below. This is the proposed lower level floor plan. You would arrive at the lower level down a central stair to a, a lobby gallery area that has wall space and cabinets for art displays. To the left of that would be the children's area. And that has been increased in size from the present, present plan to, accommodate, to better accommodate existing programs and new programs for the children. There would be an at-grade exterior exit to an enclosed play space with a, with a amphitheater built into the side of the hill. To the, to the right side of the plan would be the lower level of the existing Pond Cove School Annex building. And that would include two meeting rooms which are divisible by a movable partition or expandable by a movable partition would be more accurate. Um, support space for smaller meetings, storage, janitorial space, and also we're showing a new 
stairwell at that north end of the existing building where the former entrance used to be. And that would be a, a glass <coughs> enclosed stairwell to allow natural light down into the lower level gallery so that the lower level of the existing building becomes much more pleasant because of the natural light. With all of these plans, we prepared a preliminary project budget. And we based our, our budget on very recent experience with the Gray Public Library. We also got input from a professional cost, estimate, cost estimator. And uh, we ran and had this reviewed by Greg Marles, the Cable is the Director of Facilities and Transportation. For hard costs, <coughs> excuse me, which are basically bricks and mortar costs. We used $150 a square foot for the upper and lower level renovations. We used $200 a square foot for the new construction upper and lower level and used a lump sum of $350,000 for site developments which include things like grading and parking lot and landscaping and site utilities. We included an estimating contingency of $162,000 for total construction cost projected construction cost of $3,404,000. Also included is $538,000 in soft costs. And these include things like advertising, printing, design fees, uh, moving costs, owner's contingency. This produced a total project, preliminary project budget of $3,942,000. And this does not include renovations to the Spurwink School furniture and equipment, which Molly indicated would be a separate private fundraising and relocation of the historical society. We believe this to be a realistic and achievable budget for this project scope. We'd like to summarize the design with the following comments. Remove the section of the library, which becomes a barrier to the school and the community create a pedestrian walkway between the library and the elementary school that supports and encourages shared resources. Restore and repurpose the Pond Cove School Annex and construct a two-story addition that takes advantage of the south sloping site to create an at-grade daylight lower level for the children's area complete with an enclosed outdoor play space. We believe the greenest building is the one already built and that's why we would like to reuse the Pond Cove School Annex building. And in so doing, we would honor the history and heritage of Cape Elizabeth. A new two-story addition takes advantage of the site conditions while minimizing the footprint, exterior surface area, and thermal envelope. This reduces site costs and also energy consumption costs. The Spurwink School remains available for other uses and programs. Add enhanced landscaping for outdoor performance space in the lawn area in the front of Pond Cove School Annex. Add parking with adequate drop-off space for cars and buses. The existing and new construction will incorporate proven materials, equipment, and technologies that are, low, that are durable, low maintenance, and energy efficient. The completed building will qualify for LEED status, that's leadership in energy and environmental design. The new addition will be designed to complement and be compatible with the 1912 Pond Cove School Annex and the 1849 Spurwink School. We would like to conclude with a quote from a special issue on libraries and information that was put out by the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center in the spring of this year. The quote summarizes several articles in that special issue. And it goes, as libraries move into the future, we will continue to see a blend of the old and the new. And we believe that to be an important piece of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Dick and Cynthia. I would like to just point out as a committee, I think that until Reed joined us, we were really focused on our research and our analysis. And then they walked in the door and they brought us some terrific drawings to look at. 
Thank you. I, I, I think we really responded to those. And I think that their drawings reflect uh, the fact that they have extensive experience with Maine-based libraries. They've worked on 20 library projects over the course of the last 30 years. I also want to point out, I think that their um, drawings are certainly preliminary. Um, they do, however, focus on the fact that these drawings really respond to what we heard from people in the community. They emphasize flexibility and efficiency. They speak to the community's desire for a green building. They keep the TML on the existing site. Um, as I said, by the way, they, they um, I think the quote that Dick gave us was that the greenest building is the one that's already built. We heard that from many, many people. There was a desire for a green building. Um, and importantly, at least to me and I, I think to many other people along the way in this process, um, they respect the feel of the town and they address the town's desire for a building that fits within the town's cultural and historical context. I think their drawings were terrific. Um, I'm happy at this point to take any comments or questions that anyone on the council has and jump right in. And again, I'm happy to, to review those recommendations as well. Wow. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It, uh, I'm, I'm just absolutely blown away. I'm, I'm glad that uh, the council had the wisdom to put uh, you folks to work, and I'm, I'm so happy to, to hear what has come as a result of these 29 meetings in three hours, and I think more than three hours, uh, from what I gather. There were a lot of hours that have not been accounted for here. Uh, but I'm just uh, very, very pleased to see this, and I'm, I think that uh, the approach we use to, to dig into the detail and get to a place that this kind of place is, was, was worth doing. And it clearly, it probably needed a, a vote at a referendum to say flat out no. <laughs> we just don't understand what you're trying to do. And I think with the plan that you presented us, there's certainly a better understanding of what we're trying to do and some costs that have been validated by people who know what the costs are. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just really, really pleased. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the next step for our group. But I, I just really thank you. Thank you, Mary Kate and Frank and Kathy, Jessica, and you, Molly, for the work that you've done. I mean, it's, uh, and I think, Jay, you too need to have uh, our compliments. Well, uh, you know, every, I've, every time I open my email, there was another email from you either setting an agenda or putting minutes together or informing people of what needed to be done. And I, I just, I'm very, very, very happy to see this. Thank you. And Greg Marles as well, I think, came to, I'm going to say, 29 of those meetings. And he was very involved in the process as well. Did an excellent job. That's good. Thank you. Any other comments? David? I mean, I'll echo everything that you just said, uh, Jim. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm sort of trying to figure out what the next step for the council might be. I'm looking at mm -hmm. the recommendations that are up there behind you, and I would be prepared to make a motion that we adopt most, if not all of them. It, it may be, for example, that <clears throat> the motion could be something to the effect that we accept the proposal and that we vote to form a building committee. I'm not necessarily sure we need to incorporate everything else in such a motion because yeah. The, we're accepting the report, which I think yeah. uh, still yeah. allows for flexibility. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, that's one approach to it. The approach that we had sort of, and again, there's no, nothing in, sure, it's hard and fast about this, but the approach we had was to accept the report with its recommendations, with gratitude, clearly, to all of you. And then to move to December 2nd as a workshop to sort of, peel it back a little bit, understand a little more what's behind the numbers and what's behind the recommendations. And from there, come to the next meeting in December or January, whatever our timeline looks like, and at that point, start to effectuate the actual list of priorities. And of course, the first one, obviously, is to put a building committee together. But that was the that was the approach that, that I was thinking. And again, I don't have any vision beyond uh, what the seven of us want to do here. But 
clearly what you're asking is we could be going straight to a building committee based on a recommendation you make tonight as well. But I, I felt like maybe we needed to have a workshop to dig into this a little deeper. But we've also had three of you sit through all of this. So there's certainly from, you know, in terms of my proxy anyway, I'm feeling very good about the work because I feel that we've been represented well. So David, thoughts? Do you, do you see that as a possibility or do you want to modify that a bit? I mean, I'm... I, I'm happy with either approach. I, mm -hmm. I'm just not sure I'm anticipating <clears throat> a, a huge departure in a workshop uh, okay. based on the fine work that the, the committee did already. Uh, yep. But I'm, I'm happy to wait for a workshop too. I, I'm yep. curious to see what other folks think on the council. Other thoughts? Michael? Just a thought. We, 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 we were just discussing. We have a workshop scheduled December 2nd at which it's envisioned that the council will be looking at its goals for 2014. And maybe as part of that workshop, we'd like to have a, a specific charge for the building committee, uh, you know, the, the makeup of it, if you yeah. look at consider yeah. prior to it going on the December uh, 9th council agenda. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good point uh, because we haven't really talked about how large right. that committee ought to be, right. uh, what the makeup should be. So mm -hmm. it seems like a good idea to me. Yeah. If Anyone I else could, want to weigh in, Caitlin? No, I agree with that idea of let's yeah. figure out what the committee's going to look like and what exactly okay. we want them to do. Yeah. I think that was the reason to have that workshop with that goal setting was to bring everybody along and to get a little more clarity. Um, can, I come, can I come on to that? Me? Sure. Yes, thank you. The only thing I'd like to mention is that <clears throat> um, I, I think we were very focused as a committee ourselves on moving this process forward with um, great efficiency and um, my only concern with delaying process and I, I'm certainly not making a recommendation to the council outside of what we have said here but I do just want to emphasize the fact that we feel strongly that that building committee ought to be able to come back and complete its work in time for the citizens to vote on the plan by November of 2014 and my only concern is that that that, that is a quick timeline. And so your building committee, whoever it is and whoever participates in it, will need to be formed fairly quickly and be prepared to meet regularly and have something out for folks to respond to fairly quickly and have something out in front of the community. Uh, I'm going out on a limb here, but I'm going to say by, by early fall so that the voters will be educated enough to vote on their proposal in November. So keep that in mind as you think about putting the building committee together, if you're planning to interview folks or if you're putting together a charge for them. Um, I think we all feel pretty strongly that that ought to be done and, and have something out for the voters by a year from now. But given the efficiency in the way that you folks went about your charge in delivering to us today what you have in front of us, um, I think that this next two and a half, three weeks, can be beneficial, especially as we we really put some parameters or context around the building committee charge, because then we would know best how to staff that mm -hmm. with people who wish to be part of it, but also trying to cover the talent that you would like to have represented on it. So, mm -hmm. so I don't I don't think we would be losing time, um, but you also get the benefit at our first meeting in December to vote on it, which mm -hmm. is kind of fun. So. If we did it today, you wouldn't vote on it. So I'm no, just a about. fair point. Okay. Fair point. Anyway, <laughs> trying to give you a chance. Here. Anyone else wanted to weigh in? Any Kathy, Jamie, anything you wanted? Yeah, I agree. We need to take some time to come up with the appropriate charge. That, I, that's I, that's where I'm coming from. But again, it's not to delay it in any way, shape, or form. So. And one of the things I think the the council did a particularly good job on in terms of charging our committee was you gave us a very specific timeline and we were to report back by the end of October and I think um, we had some exciting meetings because we knew we, we had to keep moving forward. It, it forced us to be very efficient sure. and I, I, I think we appreciated that. It was very helpful direction from the council. Good. So I, I guess I would entertain a motion then at this point if anyone wishes to make one and, and you have in, a suggested motion in the uh, in front of you at for item number 130, and the only addition you would add to it is that the workshop is December the 2nd. 
You're going I'd, to I'd, I'd like to make one comment Go before right I ahead. make a motion, if I may. I, I just want to uh, echo what uh, Molly McCausland said. I think that it will be prudent to to work on the building committee makeup in December at a workshop, and I'm hoping that 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 takes place in December and that we make our decision in December so that we can very likely form the committee so that the committee can hit the ground running in January. That, that's my, my hope. I don't know anyone, how long that was good. I think the um, constraint time frame we had in our committee was a real, while it was a burden in some respects, it was a real benefit. We, had, we knew we had to get things done and, and it caused us to be very efficient and to have really long meetings, but get things done quickly and be yep. very focused. So I think it was good. I also like the idea of having the uh, workshop, though, because I think the community should have the opportunity to, to at least ask some questions before we vote on this. Yep. I won't be here before yeah. you vote on this. We so can, having the we workshop. Could, could, we, you, the building committee. Right. Well, <laughs> any event, the, uh, I've got my first <laughs> applicant here. <laughs> but I think that's a great idea to, to yeah. you know, kick it off, okay. discussion with the workshop. All right. Kathy, did you want to make a point? No, you all I, said, I agree okay. with what's Jessica, been said. Jessica, you have a motion for us? <clears throat> with pleasure. I move that we accept item number 130, the Library Study Committee report, that we accept with gratitude the report of the Library Study Committee and refer it to an upcoming workshop. I have a second. Well, I've got a bunch of them here. Good. Jamie, second. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion. No, I have a question while well, we had... Molly and Reed Company here. Just a, a question for moving forward, not just with the library, but in the future. Was any numbers crunched um, to the renovations of the Sperling School Building? Because I, I see that was kind of taken out of the library. But as a, a council going forward, while well, we have you guys here and you just did all this work, I just didn't know if any look was at, you know, was it? how much it would cost to renovate that for us to repurpose it. I'll, sp it. I'll speak to that very quickly and then I'll defer to Reed and Company to respond in more detail. Um, I understand your question. Uh, one of the challenges that we have in answering that question is that we don't have a defined plan that we're asking for them to price up for renovation. So we have some options that we can think about for what to do with the Spurwing School, but we don't have something specific that we'd be looking to price up. Would we want to make it smaller or larger? Do we want to um, lift it up so that we have usable lower level space? Do we want to make it fully accessible um, with an elevator? Those sorts of questions would have to be defined in a lot greater detail. Having said that, though, I, I will let Reed and Company speak. Yep, go ahead. Two points I'd like to make. Though. One is we did make a recommendation in our report yeah. that the school be used for the transition for the library, so something has to be done with it. And number two, um, very, one of the reasons we wanted to really distinguish this building from the library is because it, it's the, the council will have to make a decision on the use of that space in the future, independent of the library. Remember right. That? That's why I was just curious. Right. Well, if, if anybody had looked at and we have. some crunching numbers, well, it's all on the top of our head. Yep. So yep. that even if it's a year from now, when we're thinking, what are we going to do with it, we can right. have an idea of the cost. It might I guess I'd have to say, no, we haven't, because of all the reasons that, that Molly indicated. We didn't really know what the scope would be, and the scope would greatly affect the cost. Personally, I think it's a small enough building in, in, and the cost wouldn't be very high, but depend, it would depend a lot on what you would did. I think to make it handicap accessible, um, to improve the heating system and other infrastructure pieces, um, it would be in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred thousand dollars, but it, the scope may be less or more than that. And mm. That's just a real, the number you'll never forget is the one we just you. mentioned. It's in the minutes. There you go. <laughs> right. Caitlin, is that? No, yeah, I was just curious okay. going forward. Any other questions, folks? All those uh, in favor? Let me, oh, sorry. one thing, sorry. Um, will we have Reed and Company at the workshop? Is that, I mean, if we're going to be talking about the charge for the building committee, I wonder if it's going to include also discussion about the design. You know, will the building committee be deliberating on whether or not they like that design, if they want some changes? You know, I, when I listened to the presentation, I thought it was great, but I also thought, oh, I wonder if they considered not making the green space on Scott Dyer, but the other place where they were going to put the parking lot. 
you know, would, did you consider swapping those? Questions like that, would that be one of the things we charge the building committee? Yeah, I, with? certainly that can We'll be, invite them. That'll be no, yeah. no problem. Yes. Great. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll try this again. All those in favor? All those opposed, it's carried unanimously. Thank you again, Molly, to you and your team. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, we're moving on to public hearing. And uh, this is in regards to the General Assistance Ordinance update. And I'll call that public hearing and declare it open. Is there anyone who wishes to address us at this time? Anyone wish to address the General Assistance Ordinance? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And uh, the chair will uh, entertain a motion. David. Uh, I move that we adopt the MMA General Assistance Model Ordinance. Second. I'll second. Just a second. Thank you. Do we have any discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? It carries unanimously. Item 132, the draft Greenbelt Plan. Before we take this vote, I just want to ask if anybody has anything they wish to discuss relative to any uh, disclosure they'd like to make or not about the Greenbelt plan that's in front of us or uh, relationships they may or may not have with people that are involved as principals or otherwise. Uh, I'll talk for a second, Jim. Um, there, there was some emails, I think, that came to the town manager and maybe to you. I don't know if they were circulated to the entire council or not, but questioning um, my relationship with one of the, I don't know if stakeholders is the right word, but one of the property owners in Shore Acres. Um, I previously had a, a business relationship with David Leopold at the local Buzz. We no longer are business partners. We have not been for about a year. So in the interest of disclosure, uh, disclose that. But um, I'm, I'm not planning on recusing myself from any deliberation on the uh, Greenbelt draft plan. Um, I know a lot of people in this town. And I know people on both sides of that equation. And I have no uh, uh, need to recuse myself. Uh, thought about it and I'm comfortable with that. Good. I, again, um, I did receive, you know, a couple of emails and, um, and they weren't circulated to the council so that's important to recognize that. So, um, any, anyone else who, David? No, I'm just going to uh, echo, I, I don't have uh, a former business relationship with folks in Shore Acres, but I know people who live there. I think we all know people who live there, and I, I don't think that has any impact on my ability, as it wouldn't on Jamie's either, to review the issue and, and, and come up with this, uh, an approach that I think is in the best interest of the town. So I, I agree that that's sort of, you know, if you felt that it would, then you could recuse yourself voluntarily, but I don't think that's the situation that it would be required. Thank you, David. Anyone else? Or Okay. Um, all right. So uh, we have a motion in front of us. If uh, I could, uh, I'll entertain a motion from a counselor. Anyone wish to? David? Uh, I move that the council hold a workshop on November 13th on the draft Greenbelt Trail and that we set a public hearing on the plan for Monday, December 9th at 7 p.m. I have a second. Yes. I'll second. Any discussion about the recommendation? No? I, all those in favor? All those opposed? It's carrying unanimous. Item 133, we have a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding sandwich board signs and open flags. Well, Kathy? This certainly isn't going to be half as stimulating as the last few things we've done, but um, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're proposing a, a couple of changes. Um, <clears throat> And I'll just briefly go over the, um, the differences. Um, first of all, there's some additions to um, the definitions 
one being an open flag, um, flag that says open. You know, at first I didn't know what an open flag was. <laughs> and then a uh, sandwich board sign definition. Um, and the bigger changes are in uh, section 2123. Um, and what we're doing is we're um, allowing um, business signs, sandwich board signs, um, permitted in um, zones TC, BA, BB, and BC. Um, the um, gist of it is we're going to allow, we're proposing to allow one sandwich board sign per business establishment. Um, when multiple businesses share the same property, each business establishment shall be allowed one sandwich board sign upon a determination by the code enforcement officer that each business is sufficiently separate to not undermine the intent of the limit. Um, the sandwich board sign shall be limited to a maximum gross area of 12 square feet per side and a maximum height of four feet. Uh, the sandwich board sign shall be located on the property where the business establishment is located, but may be located in the right of way adjacent to the property. The town reserves the right to require a sandwich board sign to be moved out of the right of way in the interest of public safety, and sandwich board signs shall not be placed on a sidewalk. Uh, sandwich board sign shall only be displayed during the hours of business establishment is open for customers or visitors. It shall be weighted or secured to avoid being carried away or blown away, the, um, and it shall not be independently illuminated. Um, um, and then it goes on to talk about the open flag um, as being an addition that they could also have an open flag, um, and that's allowed without a permit, uh, the open flag piece. Um, the open flag shall not exceed three to five feet, shall not be included in the total allowable sign area per establishment in section A above, which is important because they have an allowable sign um, 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 area. And it can only be displayed during the hours of a business establishment is open for customers or visitors. The, the real um, um, piece that, which is why this, this is before you, is that um, what we have allowed in the past is three 30-day permit signs for, um, for sandwich boards. And we had at least five businesses that came and said, we'd like to have a sam sandwich board for 12 months a year. Um, so this allows um, for them to do that, um, and they would get one permit, um, similar to what they get for their um, their permanent signage. So, um, have I missed something, ordinance folks? No, I just to echo that it was it was largely a response to the local businesses to to try to help them increase their visibility and make it less cumbersome for them to comply with the ordinance. Uh, and so I mean, that was really the goal that we had in mind when we uh, moved this forward to the council. I mean, it's the second time we've responded incredibly fast to something that's been identified as a problem or a shortcoming or whatever. And my, my hat's off to you folks for getting this as done as quickly as possible and as comprehensive. I mean, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting when you read it. You're even talking about they can weight down the sign so it doesn't does, it doesn't get carried off or doesn't blow away. I mean, it's pretty interesting how detailed you got. Well, it was very helpful that the businesses came to a couple of the meetings and gave us some feedback. Which is good. Um, cool. Like, you have to make sure it's heavy enough so that when it gets windy, it doesn't blow away. Well, yeah. we might not have thought of that ourselves. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, Kathy, do you want to make, uh, make a motion? Um, yes, I think that this is, um, I believe the motion is to have it for a public hearing. Is yes. that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I move that we, um, um, have the proposed uh, new site and ordinances go to public hearing, and I don't have the date. It's on Monday, no, December Monday the 9th. 9th. At 7 o'clock. Thank you. Yeah. Do I have a second to Kathy's motion? Yeah, Caitlin. Okay. Second. Seconded. Any discussion? Can I just go ahead, Caitlin? ask that uh, for the public hearing, maybe we on the agenda put this one before the Greenbelt, so that any business that might want to come doesn't have to sit through the Greenbelt public hearing? Well, Caitlin, you have a great opportunity to turn to your right and talk well. to the person who will <laughs> set that agenda and determine where it fits in the hierarchy. And Just as a courtesy. Okay, good. So, okay, uh, all those in favor? All those opposed, it's carries unanimous. Move on to number, uh, item number 134. The main Department of Transportation offer to pave Route 77 from the Inn by the Sea to Monastery Road in the year 2014. 
Michael or Bob? I'd, I'd be happy to. I, you have on your agenda, uh, you know, a, a welcome news, I think, from the main Department of Transportation. Uh, anyone that drives that section of Route 77 beyond the end by the sea, and particularly the section between the State Park and Monastery Road, which is the, the, the Monk's property driveway, know that it's a little bumpy. It uh, <laughs> hasn't been paved in some of it in over 40 years. So it's time, and the state wishes to do it. Uh, the, uh, with federal money, state money, the local <coughs> share would be 15 percent. So I uh, strongly recommend you authorize me to sign whatever it takes to uh, get it done. Good. Thank you, Michael. Bob, did you want to add any wisdom to this? No, it's just a uh, uh, Great. Good. Did we ask for this, or did this come voluntary? Did we do something? No, they, I got a phone call one day. I try to figure out why. I mean, did they all of a sudden find money someplace that they didn't know what to do with? Or? Actually, they, they... Jim, don't question they, it. They did. I mean, come on. Actually, they did. Tax <laughs> had some money in something called a holding pen, and it just happened that they were looking at different roads recommendations, and they said, well, let's take the next two on the list that would, might have been programmed in the next two years. Let's move them to the very front and get them done. That's great. And this was one of the two projects. Great. Motion? I move that we authorize the town manager to um, t take up the main Department of Transportation's offer to pave Route 77 from the Inn by the Sea to Monastery Road in 2014. Seconded. Frank? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item 135, the Taste of Maine event at Fort Williams Park. Yeah, th this is an event, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't recognized. Did you want me to say no, something? No, I just I figured you were going to jump right on it. I did. Uh, I, did. I appreciate that. <laughs> I was that. a little premature there. You I'm were, sorry. Very definitely. <laughs> anyway. I'm going to send you a text. This, this is, yeah, thank you. This is an event that's been reviewed by the Fort Wayne's Advisory Commission. I hope everyone was able to open the attachment. I got a complaint from one person. They weren't. But, you know, it's a pretty ambitious event, uh, but it sounds like it might be a fun thing for the community. And the Fort Wayne's Commission really gave it a a lot of review, there's a whole bunch of conditions that they have in there uh, that Bob uh, helped them to write. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think it'd be a nice thing for the community to give a try. I've been to these events on several occasions and they are very well done. Uh, great group of volunteers. So I have a motion. David. Oh, sure. Uh, I move that we accept the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's recommendation to approve the Taste of Maine event on June 29th, 2014 at Fort Williams Park per the conditions set forth by the Commission. We have a second? Second, second Jamie. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous. Item 136, tobacco use at Fort Williams Park. Michael. Thank you. I was putting up my hand. Uh, <laughs> actually, this is a, it, it, I apologize. This is a bit of a misnomer on the, on the uh, <clears throat> agenda. I, was, I had seen a draft proposal, and they were considering both banning tobacco use and banning smoking. Uh, I, I finally, I think Bob had sent it earlier, but I got the final proposal today from them, and it's actually a prohibition of smoking. It's not all tobacco. So. People can chew whatever they want to do, but uh, huh. under this proposal, but it's uh, recommended to be referred to the ordinance committee, and this uh, would ban smoking under the, the proposal from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Five to zero vote from them, so it'd be good maybe if the ordinance committee looked at this and decided whether or not you wish to pursue this. Jim, those new members of the ordinance committee would love to take a look at it. I, it just this is a question for the town manager, and this may have happened before I joined the council. Did the council consider this issue once before yeah. and decide not to pursue it? Yeah, this was a few years, years ago. I it was uh, more than Mary, five years Mary, ago because it was before my time. Mary and Lynch. This was, uh, this was something when they were both on the council yeah. and they looked at it. You know, we, were the, we were the first community in the state of Maine to ban smoking on school grounds. Uh, that was back <clears> in the, the very late 70s. Mm. So uh, it's an area that, you know, a lot of, and a lot of places have banned smoking in parks with concern with secondhand smoke and with the, you know, if you look at the number of cigarette butts uh, mm -hmm. that pollute the place, you know, it's, it's worthy of you considering whether or not it's appropriate or not. I, I'm prepared to make a motion. I just, I think the uh, issue 
six years ago was, hey, this isn't enforceable, so why enact it? But now that I walk Fort Williams almost every day, there are cigarette butts all over the place, and mm -hmm. I would yeah. love to well, that's have us concern. consider. That's the concern of the advisory. Yeah. They I, need to. So, so I, you wish to yeah. give sure. us a motion? Sure. I would move that we refer the, to the <coughs> smoking policy at Fort Williams Park to the Ordinance Committee uh, to consider. Seconded. Caitlin, thanks. Uh, hearing any discussion? But, yes, Jamie. Yeah, I, I, probably this isn't the time of the discussion, but it'd be I guess if people still wanted to smoke, they could go outside the gate, right? They could be in the parking. You are uh, going to be on the ordinance committee, and you're going to have a shot at trying to make that happen. Just, uh, these, are, these are previews of coming attractions. <laughs> yes, yes. The folks come out from Portland that passed the referendum. It also has a way of dealing with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, are we going to make this a safe, a safe harbor or what? I mean, ne on. Neil's got his hands in it again. Neil, his Neil his hands. Left. You just see Neil get up and leave. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, I guess I'm just waiting to be recognized. That's good. That's good. Okay, hearing no discussion beyond that. All those in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you. Um, item number 137 uh, the draft stormwater program management plan. And go ahead, Michael. Mr. Malley is here to introduce <coughs> our program and speaker. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, the town is required to uh, update its stormwater program management plan uh, every five years. Uh, the first plan was adopted back in 2003. And in 2008, uh, the council approved an update to that plan. So this is an existing current plan that we've uh, been required to, uh, to manage by the main DEP. Uh, for the last two months, we've been working with Christy Rabaska of Integrated Environmental Engineering uh, to update the plan, uh, which needs to be submitted to the DEP by December 6. Uh, Christy is a Cape resident, and uh, she's also been assisting us with our uh, compliance efforts with our stormwater management program. So I'd like to introduce Christy, who will give you a brief overview uh, of the plan, and uh, then we'll entertain questions. That may take a minute for the warm up, Jim. Mm -hmm. Can we quickly do 138. Go for it. No reason I say that. Scott Furman is here from the Water District. Okay, so the on 138, and this right. is going to take a couple minutes to. Uh, okay, so the Ottawa Road combined sewer overflow plan. So we had a public hearing on October 7th. That was addressing the combined sewer overflow at the end of Ottawa Road at the municipal boundary with South Portland. It is proposed to approve the plan, and sewer rates have been set in recent years with the anticipation of the cost of implementing the plan. It's expected that the sewer rates will need to continue to be adjusted each year thereafter in an amount consistent with the rate of inflation. Yeah, and on that, uh, Mr. Chairman, you had had some questions that you worked at your previous meeting, the presentation of public hearing on this, and I did, did, that is an active link to the sewer rates. You can see the memo that was written a couple of years ago that we have, in fact, incorporated monies for this. And, Scott Furman, who is the, the director of wastewater operations, to get the title similar, is, is here. He runs all the treatment plants and interceptors of the district. He's here to answer any questions you may have. But it, it is ready for adoption. I don't, so is there any questions from the council? Uh, anything you wanted to say to us if uh, we've, uh, we had the hearing and is there anything that, that you want to add, or? I reviewed the materials presented, and Okay, great. All right. Well, I'll entertain a motion. 
<laughs> David, no, I I Jessica's taking it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, was, I thought Frank might. Uh, that's no, last no, no. Night. Frank Jessica is going to use her last opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Frank is going to use the retired <laughs> counselor. Yes, <it's> <laughs> that's right. Uh, I move that we approve item number 138, the Ottawa Road Combined Sewer Overflow Plan. You have a second. Second. Thank you, Kathy. I was looking Absolutely. to Frank, but obviously the hands are tied. <laughs> Any discussion beyond that? No. All those in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Now that your computer is all set to go. I'm all set to go. Thank you. <clears throat> go ready. So thank you for having me here. I have been, as Bob said, I have been working with the town of Cape Elizabeth for the last few months, um, helping to implement some elements of this um, stormwater program that the <clears throat> town is subject to. And so I'm here tonight just to give you a very brief overview of this stormwater program management plan. Um, you did all receive a very draft copy of this in your packets last week and a more polished copy this morning via email PDF. Um, and the copy that is in front of you, the paper copy that is in front of you reflects the more polished version that does have the figures and appendices attached. So the purpose of uh, uh, tonight's discussion. We are um, hopeful that the council will adopt this plan. Um, very briefly, the plan is a five-year plan. It will run from 2013 to 2018. It is required, as Bob said, by a general permit that the main DEP issues. It's a Clean Water Act permit. And this uh, plan is actually due to the DEP December 6, 2013. We um, realized several weeks ago that this was the only council meeting that we would be able to actually get you to adopt or you know to you know be before you for adoption um, and so um, we and since the plan isn't due until December 6th where uh, we will be reading back through it again and take the opportunity to correct any typographic errors or consistency errors that um, that we discover so we'd ask that you would include um, that um, capability in your uh, adoption if you decide to adopt it tonight. This plan does need to be certified uh, when it is sent to the DEP. It's a, as I said, it's a Clean Water Act permit and it's required to be certified by a uh, principal executive officer or ranking elected official of a municipality or a person who is delegated to do so by that uh, ranking. So if the chairman were to delegate that to Mike McGovern, he would be the one to certify this plan. So that would be an element. This, um, this plan, as Bob said, is it's actually the third uh, plan that has been developed. This is an update of uh, two prior plans. And it is required by the general permit for stormwater discharges from municipal separate storm sewer systems. And that's quite a mouthful, so we refer to it as the MS4 program for the M and the four S's in the separated storm sewer system. This is a general permit that regulates 30 communities in the state of Maine and has done so since 2003 when the first general permit was issued. And um, each of these permits, because they're Clean Water Act permits, are required by law to be, uh, last for no more than five years. So every five years a new permit comes out, they change the requirements a little bit, we have to change the stormwater program management plan a little bit. So we're in our third permit uh, cycle, and that began in July 1 of 2013, and it will run until June 30th of 2018, and this five-year plan it coincides with that program. Um, I want to draw your attention to this map, which shows the locations of the 30 communities that are regulated by this general permit. Um, you'll notice this is a cluster of communities in the Bangor area, Lewiston, Auburn, Portland area, and southern Maine. And those are the regulated communities. And it's uh, by design that those communities are, that are regulated are um, actually located in the more populous areas of the state of Maine. The way that communities get drawn into this program is 
uh, according to whether or not they have an urbanized area, which is a U.S. census-defined term. If you have an urbanized area within your municipal boundaries, you are regulated by this general permit. And this concept of urbanized area, I said it's a very specific, it's a federal definition from the Federal Register. It's a two-part definition. Uh, first, to have an urbanized area within your municipal boundaries, you have to be located within a central place, just 50,000 people or more. And then that central place is a high density population of 50,000 people, where the census blocks all represent um, 1,000 people per square mile or more than 1,000 people per square mile. So you have these high population densities, people get regulated for stormwater. And the reason that that's by design, if you think about it, it's, uh, it was actually a very, very interesting way to decide to regulate this program. When you have people in these high density areas, you get a lot of impervious surfaces, and then you get a lot of pollutants that build up on those impervious surfaces. And when it rains, the pollutants all get washed down into the separated storm drain system, the four S's, and they go out directly into the water bodies. So you have high density populations, you have high potential for stormwater pollution, people become regulated, the communities become regulated. So Cape Elizabeth has been regulated since 2003, as have 28 of the other communities that have become regulated. The other important point to note, and um, this figure is actually contained in, on page eight of the plan, um, is that this pink area is the urbanized area for the town of Cape Elizabeth, and the white area is not the urbanized area, and the area that is, the only area that this plan applies to is the urbanized area, the regulated area. So just the pink area. So down in here, we didn't have um, a high enough density population to be regulated. So this plan, as have the other three plans uh, that the town has um, implemented, this, this plan is required to address six minimum control measures. And I don't know if any of you have seen these before. But the first two, I'll run through them very briefly. The first two are public education and involvement uh, because the public is the primary potential polluter of stormwater. The public has to be educated about how to not pollute stormwater. And you can't just tell people what to do, you have to involve them. So that's minimum control measure number two. Get better participation that way. There are uh, illicit discharge, detection, and elimination issues. It's basically making sure that things that are illicit do not end up in the storm drain system. And then there are construction and post-construction runoff controls that um, need to be implemented, and those are related to sediment and erosion control. And um, post-construction, after a sedimentation pond has been built, it needs to be maintained in perpetuity. And the final is that uh, there's good housekeeping for municipal operations. Um, it's really hard for communities to go around telling other people what to do if they're not actually doing a good job at their own municipal operations. So that's the sixth minimum control measure. <coughs> so yes, it's the third plan that we have <laughs> written. So I'm very familiar with all of these concepts. And I won't run through all of the details of the plan, it's quite dense, uh, but basically a lot of the plan, if you've re had an opportunity to read through it, it says continue, continue, continue. Continue your public education efforts, continue enforcing the ordinances, um, in particular this one here, um, chapter 18 is the prohibition against discharging anything into the storm drain system that doesn't belong there. The public education pieces that go along with that, um, there are many stencils that get public works puts on town and don't dump here because this drains directly to the bay, it doesn't go to a wastewater treatment plant. I don't know if any of you have seen the ducky ads, but there's a lot of public education efforts. Those will all be continuing over the next five year cycle. And so the plan discusses those, um, those elements. And then uh, there's actually a lot of boots on the ground work. The uh, Public Works Department does the majority of the work associated with this plan. Um, they have, in, on the illicit discharge detection and elimination side, there are a number of inspections that need to happen. They have to maintain a, um, a detailed map of the separated storm drain infrastructure. And um, whenever they're going out and doing their inspections at outfalls, they obviously are identifying some maintenance efforts. And um, so here's a nice uh, 
a nice preview of a, a document, documentation of some work that was done over at Tall Pines on an outfall. The outfall was quite overgrown and the sediment had built in and it was uh, really not, not functioning as intended anymore, so Public Works went in and dug it out and put uh, some riprap around the outlet to stabilize it, install erosion control measures until the vegetation can take over to prevent erosion um, in, a, in a more natural uh, fashion, more sustainable fashion. So lots of boots on the ground work that's done that needs to continue being done, continue, continue, continue. But I do have three slides here, and then I'll finish up, because it's been a very long evening for all of you, I'm sure. Um, a few new items for this general permit um, that were not contained in prior permits. This will not be the last that you see of me. There is a new requirement in this general permit to prepare and implement a municipal or permit awareness plan. And so this is actually your first, for some of you, um, first awareness of this permit in particular, and uh, we'll be back doing a little bit more with that uh, later on, and unfortunately we have to document how aware everybody is, so there may be some surveys associated with how aware you are of the permit, and, and everybody's really surveyed out. But um, There's also a new targeted outreach uh, plan that has to happen uh, in a priority watershed or as a statewide issue, so we'll be working with some of our partners to see if there's a good statewide, is statewide issue that we want to do some public education on. So these are the two new public education items that we'll have to fulfill. Um, there are three items associated with the illicit discharge detection and elimination minimum control measure. And there are basically more outfall and ditch inspections. So um, Mr. Malley's crew will be quite busy doing those inspections. Um, there is also a new requirement to fully document um, and evaluate aging septic systems so that they don't contribute pollutant to the MS4 system. And Maureen um, is right on top of that. And um, she's actually already started this, uh, this minimum control, this, this BMP, this best management practice. And then there's also a requirement to work with the Portland Water District to assess if their <coughs> hydro flushing and water line flushing is impacting water bodies or the MS4 system. The, I don't know if you've ever seen water line flushing. They can flush at two to 400 gallons per minute. It can cause sediment and erosion control issues. And um, typically the chlorine concentrations that are coming out of potable water are around two parts per million of chlorine. And even though we can drink it, it's not always acceptable for um, aquatic species to be exposed to that concentration. So unfortunately, there's a little bit of work mostly that the Portland Water District will be doing. But um, Bob Malley and I have already met with the Portland Water District. And we just kind of have to keep track of what the Portland Water District is doing and making sure that they're not um, adversely impacting the waters within the bounds of Cape Elizabeth. And the last two items that are new that are associated with stormwater program management plan are related to the municipal operations. There was a renewed interest in fire truck washing. Um, the, in many municipalities, the fire departments are located in a downtown area and they wash their vehicles with soap and then the sediment and the grease and the oil and the soaps all go out into the storm drain system and directly into the water bodies. So we'll just have to have a, a, very, a very quick meeting, I think, with the fire department to review their truck washing policies. It's really, really, <laughs> some, some of this is a little, <laughs> a little difficult to, to say with a straight face, but it's, it is important work and the EPA and the DEP are very serious. <laughs> they are very serious about, <laughs> about enforcing on these items. And then, um, and then the last one is uh, related to a stormwater pollution prevention plan that has been in effect at the Recycling Center and Public Works Garage for a number of years now. But the requirements associated with implementing this plan um, have been stepped up a little bit and there are now wet weather quarterly monitoring. Um, uh, that both, both of the transfer station operator, both the recycling center operators and the public works department have to go out during wet weather, collect samples of the runoff, take a look at them, see if it's polluted or not, visual observations only, 
um, and they also have to do these dry weather um, inspections of their facilities to make sure that materials are being properly stored and that they're not going to contaminate stormwater during a runoff. And we've already trained the uh, public works folks and the uh, recycling center folks on how to do those inspections and, and monitoring evaluations. So lots of continue, continue, a few new things, not many, a few that we've made progress on already. And um, those are really the highlights I wanted to hit for the plan and see if you have any questions on it. Thank you. Frank? Yeah. A couple of questions. Um, are they five-year plans because every five years they get more stringent and therefore we sort of step up what we have to do? They are more stringent and a little different. Different. Yes. And, and uh, how will the town go about actually um, documenting and evaluating the septic system? I mean, so we, have, so we have a record of everyone's septic and how old it is? It's only in Trout Brook that we have to do it, but Maureen O'Meara has actually begun that documentation process. So she has to go to every homeowner and find out when the septic was installed? No, there's information in the files, in the planning files. Whenever anybody has a septic system installed, they have to, they have to get a permit with the state, and then that has to get filed with the town. So Maureen does have documentation on that. Just to clarify, it's more the responsibility of the code enforcement officer than the, the planner. Yeah, but she, she had said she, she had started she that. She knew where the, the documents were, but yes. it would be up to the, and you know, we're not going to trespass on people's, we had, a, we had a meeting the other day, yeah. we're not going to trespass on people's property. But one of the concerns we do have is that when the sewer system was put in Southern Cape Elizabeth in 1986, as people said they didn't need to go on sewer because the systems were fairly new. Well, those systems are now 35, 40 years old. You know, it, it may be time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Any other questions? Jessica? Yeah. How, how is the cost of that covered for uh, evaluating aging septic systems? Who, you know, how, how are communities you know, paid for that? Is it the... This is the, the trickling of municipal cost. And, you know, all, you know we, we're budgeting how much money now for stormwater management, just specifically for the studies and the support <coughs> that this firm gives us? And, well, we're, I mean, we're probably over $30,000 in what we do with contracted catch basin cleaning with our uh, cooperation or our interaction with the interlocal stormwater working group. Um, so all of our efforts are probably in excess of 30,000, but the septic system inspection is really permit year three, but it's sort of a, it's not really an investigative approach. It's a drive-by inspection. So we're not getting on private property, taking soil samples, those things. Occasionally, you know, I will make, uh, uh, our code enforcement officer aware of something that I see that you know may be a failing system out in the public right away, but we we won't be encroaching on private property. Uh, it's really sort of a, a drive-by inspection from the public right away, which we had several discussions on with the, the stormwater coordinator for the state on actually how we were going to do that. Yeah. So, very involved discussion. But just to be clear, if we get specific complaints now, we we will do testing of nearby streams. We we do it now. The code enforcement does it. Because we do get complaints from neighborhoods that something smells funny, something doesn't look right, and the code enforcement officer has an obligation under the law to, to, uh, to, to go uh, mm -hmm. figure out what's going on. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Yeah. Are there, um, it seems that in this, within, in this body of regulation, there's nothing that applies to agricultural runoff, and I'm wondering if there are other rules that apply to that and that would apply to some of the towns that aren't regulated because they're not urban areas, but the more agricultural areas. The, um, there, are other, there are other rules that are associated with runoff from agricultural areas. Um, concentrated area feedlot runoff has its own permit. Um, and then um, there's a whole non-point source program, which is for the non-urbanized area sections. Mm -hmm. and, and typically, organizations like the um, soil and water conservation districts work with those people to correct any of the issues that they have. And none of those rules apply in Cape Elizabeth for our farms? Um, they, the, no, not the concentrated area feedlot um, permit does not. And the other pieces, the farm lobby is fairly strong and they are not regulated under the Clean Water Act for That's really anything really except for CAFO, yeah. Hmm. 
Jamie. Yeah, what are our compliance responsibilities? Do we have written res uh, compliance responsibilities to the feds and the states? The state? The uh, Department of Environmental Protection is the primary enforcement authority in the state of Maine for this. So they are the people to whom we do prepare, you know, they, they receive the plans that we write, they receive the annual reports that we write, and they have the ability to come and audit the facility. Um, the Department of Environmental Protection is actually getting audited themselves because they have a delegated authority for this permitting <coughs> program in the state of Maine. So the EPA is actually present in the state of Maine now getting ready to audit the DEP. So they have an indirect mm. ability to. So have we ever been audited in all these three? No, we haven't been. And we've actually had very good feedback from the reports from the state. Uh, each year we have to, we've submitted these annual reports and uh, they respond back to us and say, you know, keep up the good work. And so we've had a lot of positive feedback from the state on our efforts uh, since 2003. That's good. It was somewhat alluded to in other communities they have targeted fire truck washing. So we never know when they might look to us. But that seems to be a, I've had some an issue very with heated them. discussions about our truck. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that? I did. It's a little <laughs> departmental. Yeah, there you go. Just, if, if, if I might, if go there's ahead. no other question, I might conclude this. I really want to thank, you know, uh, Bob and uh, Christy have really worked hard on this over the last several months and appreciate them. Appreciate them reaching out to code enforcement and planning, and my office as well. And you know, th this is this is important. The, the, you know the stormwater runoff because it, it you know if you look at all you know you look at all the candidates saying elections, you look at everyone. People value in this community the purity of, of the land, the, the purity of the water bodies. And while at some points these things may seem a nuisance, in the in the long term, it's it's really crucially important that we take care of of our stormwater runoff and. Uh, <clears throat> make sure that we, we, we keep our environment the, the way people have expected us uh, to keep it. So I really want to thank all those working on this. Chair will entertain a motion. Do we, Frank? I'm not sure what it is. Accepting the, uh, oh, you to, you to approve the stormwater program management. Adopting the plan. I move that we adopt the plan as presented. Is it okay? Second. Second. Any further questions? And it is understood we have permission to correct the typos. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that would be in consultation with the town manager, essentially? Yeah, we've been yeah. consulting on those the last couple of days quite steadily. <laughs> so are those amendments okay with you? Since yes. Oh, right. everything I've looked at is it's the, you know, how does, oh, I'm sorry. You should make sure that Frank's okay. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant it. Sure, Whatever Mike said, it's okay. <laughs> it's fine with a second as well, so we're good. That's good. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, item 139, a regional fire rescue service study. Michael. We have a group called the Metro Coalition, which consists of a number of the communities around Greater Portland, uh, Portland, Scarborough, <coughs> South Portland, Westbrook, Falmouth, and Cape Elizabeth. And the group gets together to see how we can collaborate on different things. And they've been discussing for a little over a year uh, to, to the, the whole issue of fire service and rescue service. And, you know, we work very closely with South Portland, with Scarborough, with Mutual Aid. And if, if you look at the, the outline of this study, you're really looking at, you know, developing really good baseline data, the different equipment that's out there, the different personnel that are out there. And, you know, while we are currently the lowest cost provider of all these services as a result of our great volunteer staff, as a result of the successful implementation of our daytime coverage of EMT, we still don't know longer term where some of these services are going. Uh, you know, as, as referenced here in other communities, hospitals have taken a, a leading role in, in providing EMS uh, emergency medical services. So, you know, I think this is a very timely study. Uh, the, the, uh, our cost would be between 2000 and 2300 And I do want to say, though, that this whole thing may fall apart in the next week. Uh, <laughs> I, we Before or after we write the check? Well, no, you just, I, full disclosure. Full, you know, I don't like to be critical of neighboring communities ever, but South Portland surprised us in the last two days by indicating that they're not sure that this needs to be done, that maybe the chiefs on their own could simply pull together the data. Uh, you know, I quite frankly think, you know, the, the, the reason the managers and the, the, the elected officials started this 
was, you know, we, we love our chiefs. We, we love our, our, fire, our fire folks and rescue folks. But, you know, a little bit of independent assessment never hurts. So anyway, I would hope that Cape Elizabeth would endorse this. The Metro Coalition is going to be meeting next week. And I would hope that maybe I could go to that meeting saying we would like <coughs> to do that and maybe hope that, you know, we can either work around South Portland or South Portland thinks about it a little bit more because they're an integral part of the regional solutions and they're, they're an important partner of ours. But, you know, but just getting all this baseline data and knowing what's out there in the future, uh, you know, I think is important. The chief is here. He's not quite as enamored of this as I am, but he, you know he's okay with it. But I just want to—he's not as enamored as it, as as I am. Uh, but I think it's important to do. We've had a lot of encouragement to look at regional, uh, regional endeavors, and and I would hope that the communities in the region, you know, it's it's not a huge investment for us, uh, but I think you know even if we don't do something, at least we've got the data, we have the understanding, and as as we approach the council for equipment purchases. In the future, you will have all the information you need to see how we, we need for our own needs as well as what we need to support the region as part of a regional uh, effort at uh, mm. putting fires out and making sure that people <coughs> get the medical care, uh, emergency medical care that they need. So is it 2,300, Michael? It, it's, if, if they still are able to do it and South Portland pulls out, it's 2,300. So we, do we have to amend this to up to 2,300 or something like that? Or? Uh, I'd yeah. do 2,500 to be on the safe side. Okay. Uh, All right. We have a motion? Sure. I, I move that we participate in a Metro Coalition study of the efficiency of fire and rescue services in the region and that we authorize up to $2,500 as Cape Elizabeth's contribution to that study. Anybody second? Caitlin, thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Just quickly, I was like, you know, Peter and I have had some good discussions. I, he will be very cooperative, I know, with this, and I, I don't want to leave any, you know, that there's a whole lot of distance between us. There isn't, but we've had, had some good discussions about different ways to approach this. Is that fair, Peter? Good. He's just happy he doesn't have to wash the fire trucks anymore. Yeah, I know. I was just going to say, there will be a <laughs> shared <laughs> resource. Fire, fire truck facility. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Bart. All right. This. All right. We now have the second uh, second opportunity for citizens to address the council on items not on the agenda, and I don't see any citizens who wish to do so. And the last item on this agenda is a proposed executive session. Could I have a motion, please? Frank is going to do this as his last official duty. <laughs> he might move. Now, now, now there's a lot of pressure. On me. Uh, I move that we enter into executive session in conformance with 1 MRSA section 405 60 to receive from legal counsel Kenneth Cole III an update on legal issues involving the regulation of outdoor shooting ranges. I have a second. I have a second. I have a second. Any discussion? Yeah, I, I'm just curious to know why this is something that goes into executive session. The attorney. Ken, did, could you, would you be kind enough to come to the podium and explain? Thank you. Under the right to know law, there is an exception for consulting with an attorney in regard to your rights and responsibilities. And one of the things that has been brought up num any number of times, both by uh, the uh, <clears throat> gun club members and the abutters, are issues in regard to potential municipal liability and others. Um, all of which are better discussed in executive session uh, than in a public session, given uh, candor that might be required. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, oh, I think he is. Yeah. Um, all those in favor of this? Of course, myself. All those in favor? It's six and one for excusal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, do you want me to sit down? Mike, you don't want to keep that stuff? No. Thank you.